going back Now I'm going to buy into all that Hey, hey, ain't going to hide Gonna let all the fears lie Go for the nature, it's on my side Got a hold of the love and all right. Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to The New Now. I'm delighted to have, uh, well, these two guests on for the first time, Ryder Lee of Raised by Giants, and probably our viewers are very familiar with Campbell from Autodidactic, as we've done so many together. Today, I figured we'll tackle the topic of doing fine at the end of time. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. How's it going? Well, Ryder, Lee, you and I were talking a bit off camera, but a little bit. You, you've interviewed David Dubine a couple of times, and, and Campbell has had him on as well. And I guess it's a good place to start with end of time scenarios. You know, what's going on, what could be going on, and how to make sure you're doing fine in relation to all of that. Well, I don't really think that people understand how finite our society is. You know, literally everything can be gone in a matter of minutes. You know, one flip of the switch, internet goes down, we're screwed. You know, everything has been digitized. Documents have been digitized. Records have been digitized. Money is basically mm -hmm. digital money. There, We've been working with digital money for a really long time. It's not coming. It's already here, right? Banks, books, grocery stores, the post office. And I understand why they did it that way, right? It's for efficiency and, and getting things done quicker. But the problem comes is when your entire system is built on top of that, right? And really nothing is going to last. Nothing really is finite within our reality. Uh, and if the internet goes down, this generation literally has nothing. People, you know, are, are thinking that they're making some form of difference on the internet. And maybe they are. Maybe we are. We, we possibly could be. But... If everything can just be erased and in 100, 200, 300 years, no one would even know that we existed. And I think that that is a very high possibility. And the last 23 years has been about nothing but the Internet. It's how everyone communicates. It's how people get their voice out there through social media. You create content. Right. And what uh, a lot of people's lives revolve around is the Internet. And if you take that away. We have nothing. And I'm willing to bet within 100 to 300 years, if the internet is completely wiped, people in the future would not even know that we exist. All of my work has been done on the internet. My channel, my podcast, my documentary, uh, it's all on the internet and it can be taken away very easily. And if by some chance the internet gets wiped, there wouldn't be any physical evidence to prove any of the work that I've done and the work that a lot of other people have done. And people can say, oh, well, make sure everything's backed up onto a hard, hard drive and all that or whatever. And I do that, but there's, this is the thing. Who's to say that in a hundred years time or 200 years time or sometime in the far distant future that people will even be able to use USB drives, right? Or a yeah. type C connector. We've seen how fast yeah. our technology has went. It's it used to be floppy disk. Now, no one has a floppy disk drive. You can't even use a floppy disk. They're completely obsolete. So why do we believe that in the future, USB drives won't completely be obsolete as well? So that means even if someone finds your hard drive in the future through all of the rubble and the collapse of society, if that is the direction that we're going to go, they aren't even going to be able to figure out a way to use it, which I think is the case for a lot of these lost civilizations and a lot of these uh, um, lost communities, they were just using a technology that we have absolutely no idea how to figure out because it's so different than ours. Well, it takes you right into your studies, Campbell, and Tartaria and yeah, yeah. civilizations. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, all, all the ancient, you know, yeah, buildings that look like they've got tech. I mean, I was talking about on an interview the other day that, you know, when we look at that, we you know, we look at it through the eyes of our civilization, right? So we look at, you know, the antiquitech and think, oh, well, that was to get power to, you know, to, to tap it so we can run machines and things. But that's probably not what they were doing. I think it was probably a lot more, um, you know, energy-based and based on on basically the human body, right? Like like making us more healthy and looking at as our body is, as being the ultimate machine. And, and it, 
all these other things just aiding it where and I guess that's the expansive you know I talk a lot about the the nature the nature grid natural grid versus the, the closed circuit which is you know the L the electronic grid which is what they you know which just runs us around in circles right and that's what they want and yeah we've got to a point where we're completely dependent on that just I mean look what happened a couple of years ago when toilet paper disappeared right People went crazy, but where did they all head? They headed to the shops, right? Because that's where they they get. That's the only place they know to get stuff. So if if the it's, if you know if the supply chain goes down, which you know they, they want us to think is going to happen, then what happens? So you know the end game is we've really you know we've got to take responsibility for everything, right? We've got to be able to respond to to whatever comes our way, and that's really the greatest knowledge. It's not it's not information. You know that that's the greatest power. It's the knowledge of what to do with that, right? The knowledge of living again, which again is what sort of they've schooled out of us, right? Like even when I was in school, we still had you know like home ec, right? Home economics, and they teach you to cook and stuff. Mm-hmm. That doesn't exist anymore. You know, there's hardly art anymore. There's, yeah, I mean, we know, right? The school system's literally designed to make us good workers, and that that's pretty much it. And then and to get us in the system in this around in circles in this closed circuit. So um, to me, I think that all the all the answers lie, lie in nature and all everything else you need, right? I mean, when you think about it, everything we have it all comes from nature. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. I bookmarked a uh, an article that said "Grow your own toilet paper" around that time. So for anyone listening <laughs> that wants to go to nature, grow some mullein plants, big fuzzy, <laughs> comfortable leaves that grow out there and grow but, very well. <laughs> I remember my dad telling me a story like that he basically said they didn't even have toilet paper back in the 40s and 50s and they would use like the paper that, that the apples came in uh, you know they'd all have a sheet and they'd save that and that, so i mean even toilet paper it's not that old and look how dependent we all are on it on on it's just i don't know it's a weird world you guys remember back i think it was there was an article that i read a really long time ago that it was back in like the early I don't know, 40s, 50s, 60s, somewhere around in there, but they were talking, it was a hoax article and it was a hoax newscast that they were talking about how spaghetti uh, grows from trees. And if you uh, <laughs> and if you go to the spaghetti farm, you can harvest all the spaghetti that, <laughs> <laughs> that you want. And some people actually believed it. See, my whole thing here is that it's my belief that human actions are based upon imagination. And this is something that we were kind of talking about last time. Imagination, belief, and faith. It's not objective observation. And I'm pretty sure that the government, the military, and politicians know this as well. And you can pretty much track back anything and everything to emotion and fear. And the question then becomes, how can we control human imagination? Can we shape and mold the world's collective destiny? If so, how do we do this? Well, how you do it is by making sure that the source of the control is never identifiable Mm. by the public, right? And then you can effectively prepare everyone for unavoidable changes, push the collective mind in the desirable direction that you want, And that's why it's important that the intelligence agencies, the advertising companies are very interested in mythology and things that may or may not be true. So therefore they can weaponize it. This is why we've seen a a rise in the contactee community. We've seen a rise in UFOs and UFOlogy, which is used to play with our imagination which represents experiments in the direction of weaponized folklore, raising Mm. superstition, mental illness, and paranoia. It's interesting we say weaponized folklore, you know, in that, you know, all the dramas in North America were based on, you know, the old West, the wild West, which never existed the way they, they, they share it. And, you know, being in Japan, all the folklore is the samurais and all the dramas here, like all the old dramas are samurais. And, you know, if you look, Kemble and I've talked about this old pictures of samurais, they look like the three of us more than Asian people. 
They look very white or very Tertarian. So even the history that they believe is true here, you know, is probably, like you said, weaponized folklore to, uh, to put people to sleep. Oh, this is how our past was. Now we've evolved. You know, now this is the future. It used to be the Wild West. You know, even in recently, I was watching some of the Wild West uh, movies that, uh, you know, the old ones from 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, came on. And it obviously looks like bullshit. You can see now they're actors pretending and sitting on horses and all that. But when you're a little little boy, you know, I used to go to those shows, too, and you used to have that imagination. And they seem so real to you. You know, you go, oh, my goodness, wouldn't it be good to ride a horse and carry a gun and to be free on the range and you know, to all, all of, you know, drink whiskey and gamble and all these things you used to see in those. And then you look back, you know, as an adult with a bigger perspective, like you've mentioned, realizing a lot of this stuff is just, you know, Hollywood, Hollywood, you know, the Holly, the, the magic wand of, of imagination of bringing stuff that's not real to your face. And, uh, you know, you start to see through it, as you said, Ryder, and it allows you to see, like, what do you do now? You know, like, how, how do you become fine when you realize all the, everything you've been passed along? Uh, you know, it's like a hangover from the wine the next day and it's all gone. Well, and you see that with yeah. uh, superhero movies nowadays. Uh, sorry, Campbell. Go ahead. Oh, you're on. You go. No, it's all good. I, I talked. I talked for. A minute, so <laughs> just, yeah, your your turn to talk. <laughs> um, yeah, I call it the overlay. Right, it's like this reality that they try and and, and lay on top of our real reality, and and it's an imagined reality, and that's why they have, you know, school, the media, songs, you know, all this. There's so much effort in going into giving us ideas and showing us the world that they want. Because I still think it comes back to that, you know, those who wish to rule us aren't creators, right? They don't have that creative spark. You know, you mentioned before, right, about the world's run off imagination, right? And, and we have that, but they don't. So they, they get us to think and to imagine the future they want, and then we create it for them, right? Mm. So, so this is... You know, really, you know, we, we've heard it from all the great philosophers, you know, go inside, right? The answers are inside. And I think that that's true. We need to start asking ourselves and, and contemplating, right? Like spending, because the other thing that this, you know, L circuit does is it's, it's, it's our attention, which is probably the greatest commodity at the moment, I think, is attention, right? Um, especially when you look at those that wish to rule us, you know, versus us. And, so yeah, that that this is everything's based on getting our attention, getting us to believe what they want to believe. We go out and create it. But if we go inside, you know, and contemplate and get that time which they don't want us to have, our own thoughts, then I think we start to get in tune, you know, we start to get answers, you know, ha have, you know, unique thoughts again, right? Because they're turning the whole world into an echo chamber. Like whatever you believe or, or or researching i mean you can see it right you you know if, if i like listen to music like i listen to like two songs on youtube and then you go back and everything's music right after two so you could like they just yeah. mess with it whatever you look at just surround you with that because they don't want you you know expanding this is what the closed circuit is right it's contraction that's the opposite to nature so yeah i mean yeah going i think all the answers are inside and that's really going to be out you know the way out is in as they say yeah, and i think you brought up a really good point uh, this currency and, and time and attention because i think that i don't think the currency is what, like paper money it's not anything physical i think the most valuable currency is time and attention you know, you can get money back. You can make more money always. You can uh, get more physical things if you need them and you work hard and you do those things. But what you're never going to get back is time. And I don't think people really realize how valuable of a currency time is and your attention and what you put the direction of your mind into. I think that that is the ultimate currency. Yeah, we used to take current affairs in school, I remember, and it's got a whole new definition now. Current affairs, like moving you in a different direction in a way that things are going. You used to think it just meant news or what's going on. And, you know, even the news sections used to have current affairs. I remember a current affairs section in the newspapers I used to read, you know, when I was younger and growing up. So it's given it a whole new idea of of the the, the people that want to control us, as you say, Campbell. You know, maybe they knew back then, you know, you, you write down the current affairs and then that's the way the current, the currency, the world flows. And, uh, you know, as we've seen, you know, news isn't what's happened 
you know, it's all backwards in this world. They're they're giving you the news because they want to show you what you're going to create moving forward. You know, it's an inverse backwards world from what I've seen. Yeah, it's like when I was young, we used to have like the music, you know, the top 20 and 40 and whatever. I don't know if they still have it. You know, so you'd have your number one song. And back when I was young, I, I used to think, oh, that's the song that has sold the most records. <laughs> but now I understand that it's not that's the song they want to be number one so they put it as number one and then everyone goes out and buys the records it's 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 completely reversed and same with everything right that's what the news is very interesting you know where your attention goes where things flow you know imagination i'm happy you brought that up and the echo chamber being that this is a reflexive reality you know as campbell said the one person's talking about it a hundred people are talking about it i mean even yesterday i was watching another channel giving a different version of what happened to all the tartarians you know, the inverse of what happened during, you know, the last world wars and that they killed them all, you know, and blamed it on a certain group or the other group. Some say it was this side, some say it was the other side. I don't need to get into the historical shenanigans. It seems to upset a lot of people. But, you know, this fellow had a different perspective on that. That's what they were doing in World War II, besides bombing all of the Tartarian buildings in Europe and bring it, you know, down to their knees. They were actually killing off the last vestiges of that uh, timeline of that imagination, you know, the old world you know, to bring us into this new world, you know, and it's probably what all of the uh, so-called wars were about anyways, you know, to shake it up, to change the timeline, to destroy everything. And it must be, uh, in, in their idea, a lot easier now, as as Ryder said, you know, they don't have to go through the wars right now. They don't have to destroy a whole bunch of buildings. You know, they don't have to, you know, wipe out and bury and, and deny and put up, you know, false stories all over the place. They just have to turn a switch, like you said, and then suddenly everything that is, you know, you've said and I've said and Campbell have said is true, so to speak, and out there in this way, in this digital way, is gone. And what, what an easy way to wipe things, you know, talking about, uh, you know, could be the whole reason why they played with the toilet paper and the shit hitting the fan is just to give people a clue as to, uh, you know, how easy it is to, you know, to wipe the ass of civilization and, you know, leave them heading for the hills and their melon plants. If we go into a reset, uh, another reset, then this would probably be the easiest reset that they have ever had to do, that has ever happened. I mean, nothing is built to last, right? You buy something, it breaks very quickly. And I was talking to David Dubine about this too. And you have to buy a new one, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's consumerism uh you know if you look at the light bulb conspiracy there's a, a fantastic documentary made on that in 2010 but the things that seem to last are appliances and tools from decades ago you know uh the refrigerators from the 60s and the 70s you know those are still working i think that that's going to outlast nuclear war probably if that ever happens those refrigerators are so freaking sturdy right now if you walk into an antique store to this very day all the stuff that's in that antique store still works it's all very usable because it's mostly manual things like uh, cranks and presses, and they're all built very well. They're built to last. Now, I've asked several people this, not only on my show, and I want to get your guys' thoughts on it, and I think it's going to solidify my point here. And everyone, I've even talked to people about this in the sauna at the gym because I like kind of picking people's brains and getting what normal, everyday people think about, right? And I was like, if you were to take us 100 to 200 years in the future, let's just say that we all uh, got into a time machine right now, went 100 years into the future. What do you think would be in that antique store? Would it be the same stuff <laughs> that's in it today <laughs> or the stuff that's being made today? And everyone that I've talked to says the same stuff that's in it to this day is still going to be in it in a hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. I guess look at the buildings, right? Like all these old buildings that have been around, you know, but, but they just don't seem to wear down or break down all the old big, you know, old world buildings. And, you know, they throw up buildings today and that, and, and they're done in 10 years. I mean, housing, you know, I mean, half, some of the housing, you know, in Australia, because they're just whipping up these little, you know, prefab houses on tiny blocks so quick. I used to do um, work and put in, like, window 
covers and things like this on houses. And most of the windows weren't square, you know, the walls were wobbled. Well, like they're clearly not built to last. It's no. like, it, and it is consumerism, but it's also, you know, people, you know, we don't have the skills. Like we don't take pride in any of this stuff anymore. Like we don't really, you know, trades, trades people are just, you know, people who know how to do what everyone else has done. You know what I mean? We're trades people back in the day, like, woodworkers and that but they use their imagination as well right they weren't just set to a, a script kind of thing you know a mechanic today just just works on cars and fixes them he doesn't go out and, and build you know cars or, or have any creativity in there really and i think that's what they've taken right and you know as far as the old stuff you know a lot of people think oh you know hand press you know having to do things oh that's so old-fashioned that's so antiquated but you know we've got all these devices today that do things for us and most people tell you they're bored, mm. right? They've got this time. They don't know what to do with it, you know? And, and what's the other thing? We're all unhealthy, you know? Like, so if you're out there using your, your body and using these hand crank machines and that and do things, you're going to stay healthy and you're not going to be bored and you're going to get satisfaction. So I think we've been sold this whole, you know, massive lie, right, that, that this technology is going to make our lives better. But it's fast becoming apparent that it's not. It's doing the exact opposite. You know, and it's all tied Which, into the grid as well. You know, it's all tied into electricity, right? So all these modern conveniences are, are in the L or the other L, the you know, the, the ACDC or whatever grid. And as uh, Ryder said, how hard is it? You know, they turn it off. You know, look at all the Tesla drivers that were stranded in the winter in the United States yeah. and they, they couldn't uh, charge their cars in Chicago or something. And then, you know, it used to be you fill up a car, you know, gas, you can go for a full day. If it broke, you can find the wire that was missing. You know, tighten a few screws, you know, blow some uh, dust out of the carburetor, and then you're good to go. You know, I remember looking in old cars and being able to fix them, even though I didn't know what was going on, by using some logic of how things flowed. Okay, this is blocked, this hose, you fix it, it's gone, there's, you know, a loose, you need a new battery, good, you're good to go. Now, you know, you look at a computer, and who's setting these up? You know, what sort of consciousness, you know, what sort of uh, life is is working from uh, from the, this, this way of... Um, computer technology like you said that's easy to shut off you know it seems to me if we're going to like segue a little bit there could be a little bit of non-human intelligence going on that's kind of directing us towards something that we don't have any control over because we don't naturally know how to fix computers right you know uh, we don't naturally like if you look at a car you can naturally figure out you used to be able to naturally figure out how it works you know i, I talk with a fellow too like if you know you see wood you burn it it's like almost a natural thing right it's like some heat you set it up you do it you no one needs to really teach you, so to speak. It just seems like a natural flow of how things work. Now you look in a computer. I don't see anything natural about that. You know, not not for me, anyways. You know, it seems like the, a Silicon Valley or a Silicon life instead of you know organic life, which is isn't that what they say? You know, a euphemism for that. Oh, that's just organic. Like it's a natural flow of things. Like you can just figure it out. You know, your intuition, as you like, or your imagination, which are or should be attached to each other. Instead of these other things where you look in a cell phone, you go, how does that work? I don't, I don't know. I better buy a new one. You know? Yeah, man, you crack a screen on a cell phone and you got to go and get it. <laughs> you know, it's like ridiculous. Well, also, too, it may be that they make electronics so complicated and uh, to where the, a normal person can't figure them out so that they can run the monopoly on it so that they are the only ones that can create it so that nobody else can uh, create a cell phone to create a, uh, a conflicting company to compete with a lot of these other big companies. Right. So they'll be like, Oh, we'll just, we'll just make it as complicated as possible. We'll put all these processors, all these little chips and all this stuff. So no one can really figure out how it works or how it runs so that they can't duplicate it. Right. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I agree, man. It just keeps us in the dark. That's why, you know, people keep saying, you know, why doesn't someone create, you know, another internet or another this or another? It's, it's because, you know, how, how do you even, like, I don't even know how I would even start or contemplate how to start doing something like that. And even, you know, though we, we kind of imagine that there's all these, you know, really smart people out there that are building all this stuff, I think, you know, the truth is it's, it's probably a much smaller group than we think, and they're probably all you know, owned, right? But but it does seem that there's another intelligence out there, right? I mean, it, you know, before, you know, four years ago, everyone was saying all the time, you know, how do, how do we advance so fast? You know, you got the meme of, you know, the, the first plane flight in 1912 and then, you know, by 
the 19, you know, World War One, they had like, you know, planes everywhere and bombers and then technology. It's gone very quickly, right? So is there something behind it? Because now we've got the, the rise of AI, you know, what exactly is AI? Because, you know, I think there is an AI, but I don't think it's what they're presenting. I don't think it's chat GTP. I think that's an algorithm. But, you know, there seems to be something else out there, right? This, this in you know, whatever, intelligence or something that, that seems to be controlling, you know, a, you know, a percentage of our population, right, to, to basically control us. I don't think that that is out of the realm of possibility, but I think the question becomes, well, if that's the case and that is true, are they physical or are they not physical? Is it a consciousness? Are they in some sort of physical body? And I don't think so. I think that if that is the case and there is something that is controlling us, and again, I'm not saying that, that it is true, but it would have to be some sort of consciousness. It would have to be some sort of um, different uh entity like a plasma being like a plasma entity or some kind of consciousness entity that would be able to infiltrate into people through consciousness or be born upon the earth through consciousness so they would put their consciousness into a shell and then they would uh you know go on like that i mm. not in the camp of that there are physical entities outside of our realm i just don't think that it's possible and if it is they're not coming here they're they're not <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. Right. like why they would just they just can't a, a physical entity is, a physical <laughs> entity that is different than us that lives on a different planet can't just come here we have yeah. a different sun we have a different different atmosphere our oxygen oxygen is different the, theirs is completely different as well. There's no way that a physical entity from outside of our planet could come here and walk around. I 100% believe that that is impossible. Now, what they could do, again, is transfer or take their consciousness from wherever they are and somehow superimpose it or transfer it into a physical shell or avatar, which... You can get into the, um, you know, the, the cyborg uh, talk or the, the clone talk. Now, I'm not saying that either one of those things are real, but if they are, that would be a good reason to create them, right? To create a fully animated cyborg or to create a, a clone shell of someone. So then you can transfer a consciousness from some entity that is not from here into that clone or into that cyborg entity. And then it can walk around here. I heard that TVs were created to originally, you know, to communicate with the, the spirit world, with the spirits. And that was the original wow. intent when they developed the TV, you know, however long in the 30s or 40s or whenever it was set up. And if imagination is real, you know, we've talked about that, you know, why wouldn't it be possible for a different kind of life that's not organic? You know, the life that's uh, attacking CO2, which seems to be the case right now. A life which does seem to be terraforming. I mean, if you look at any big city, especially where I am here in Japan or even, you know, New York or whatever, and you look at it from above, it looks like a computer chip at this point, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the grids and the, and, the, and the skyscrapers and all of the other things. So maybe it's a silicon life. I mean, as you said, Ryder, how hard would it be? They've convinced everyone to walk around with a cell phone and to look in a window. And how many people say, where's this information coming from? You know, how many people say, oh, this is the news or this is the weather or the, and not so many people will go to the bottom and question, well, where is this centralized information coming from? Who is figuring this out? If you've talked to any politician, and I've talked to a few, you can look in Biden's eyes or anybody's eyes or, you know, the guy from Canada, you know, that moron over there. It's pretty obvious that these guys aren't smart enough, <laughs> you know, to be figuring this out on their own. You know, that, you know, that's, that's so obvious, it's ridiculous. So, you know, and it could be those five people sitting in a big house somewhere. Or, you know, it could be, you know, a projection of intelligence from somewhere else to this particular place. And I guess that bodes the question is what's going on and why and wh how, where does yeah, that leave well, us at the end of time? Yeah, I mean, we have, you know, King Solomon, right, who um, built the temple with apparently, you know, with the help of demons, which are basically sigils, which are, are logos, right, which are everywhere today. Um, but they've even like linked up. Um, sigils to emojis and to computer chips. Hmm. And then we have like John D um, through to um, 
what was his name, um, who summoned Lamb, uh, his name just disappeared, um, Alistair Crowley, like he, um, you know, apparently summoned that that entity called Lamb that looked like a grey, you know, what they tell us the grey aliens. And then, you know, we have all these possessions and that. So, it, it, you know, there is evidence that there is some kind of a, you know, entity intelligence out there somewhere that's not us. And I, I kind of think that, you know, everything's kind of here in this space. I see things as frequencies. So, you know, there could literally be other, you know, realms, let's say, inhabiting the same space as us, but they're on a different frequency because we know that we only see from infrared to ultraviolet. And you may have heard of the stories of Vietnam uh, where they, they gave the fighter pilots red glasses and to help them see in the dark, but they ended up seeing demons and devils and things. Really? Uh, there's also glasses, which is the other end of the spectrum. You know, you've got the red and the uh, where they say you can see auras and things with them. Um, they've, they've obviously been banned. So, you know, it, and the demiurge, and we've got all these stories. So, I mean, I think it's, again, yeah, possible definitely that there's some entity out there that, that can influence. I think it can influence, and that's all it can do, you know. And But in the end, I think people need to give over to it, right? I don't think it can jump in and, and kick you out of your body or something. But, you know, we have all these stories, right? You've got to invite, invite the vampire in, right? Like, you know, people sell their soul. Like, they don't get it stolen. Like, they, they, they agree. So I think, you know, and we could just, you know, you've got the devil on one side or the angel on the other. It could even just be self-talk you know and maybe we're creating these i don't know but there's definitely some other influence on this world that, that we're not privy to that, that we can't see were you uh thinking of edward kelly john d and uh, edward kelly yeah well yeah was that a, and they were they were back and they were um the first ones really to get involved with you know spells and all that kind of stuff weren't they and the grimoires and Maybe. Probably all comes from Solomon. Yeah, uh, I think John D was uh, the advisor. Queen Elizabeth, Queen, the Queen Elizabeth I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and and they say one they, of the one of the they first channeled groups. they channeled this group. Oh, sorry, uh, they no, channeled no. this group uh, of beings called Enochians or uh, Enochian yeah, angels. That's right. So isn't that yeah, interesting, yeah, yeah. right? You know, one of the first people they that John D. Supposedly was one of the you know uh, pseudonyms for you know Shakespeare too, back in the day. I remember yeah, one yeah. of the people that you know did the writing and the first person with English and spell casting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it makes it really fascinating to see you know that we're talking about how like how do you protect yourself, right? How do you come back full circle? How are you doing fine? You know, at this end of time, you know, uh, you know, they, they've talked about the reset. I remember four years ago walking on the subway here and just hearing about it. The reset's coming. The re you know, it, they're they're playing they don't from these speakers, you know, throughout the system here with you know millions of people, and it was really creepy to me, right? That, that people get used to hearing computer voices. You know, even someone will put on a voice right now, you know, and you know, you know, please pay attention, please be polite, you know, when you go to a shopping center and like. I always go, why, why are people listening to these disembodied voices? You know, that's what we're getting trained to and listening. You know, don't go this way. You should go this way or it's an extra five dollars or, you know, take your children home today. And you're going like, you know, so many people have been well trained, you know, or in trained or ingrained, you know, for these disembodied voices, which are probably where TV comes from, radio, all of it. You know, the original source that even when I was little, you know, I used to get a lot of my ideas on how to be alive or my imagination from the TV. This is how a man is. This is what a relationship is. You know, this is what you want to do when you get older. This is how you feel sexy. You know, this is how you feel strong. You know, like you said, this is the number one song. You know, go buy that tomorrow. You know, you want to be with the cool kids. You know, this is these are the pants you wear and this is the haircut you have. And everyone's being different while they're being the same. And uh, it's interesting to see how we've been trained to listen to these disembodied voices, uh, whether it's from the computer or the cell phone or even a speaker in the school. You know, I go through the schools here and you hear, you know, you used to get those announcements when you were little and you would pay attention to them, you know, another, you know, so maybe more than just the information when you're ingrained and you get schooled could be even how we are trained as we take it back to the beginning of this conversation, how we're trained to use our imagination, you know, instead of using it to create something new or using it to recreate what we're being told, which is not to the best benefit of our, well, happy, long and, uh, you know, intelligent life. Yeah, really quickly, I want to 
we go back just a few to this John D and Edward Kelly thing, uh, because to my knowledge, John D and Edward Kelly, uh, these entities that they were channeling, they required blood sacrifice for the information and the technology that they were channeling in. And yeah. I don't know about you guys, but anything that requires any kind of uh, blood sacrifice is probably not the best thing to be communicating with. And, yeah. and this is a really wild connection here. So John D ended up in prison. Edward Kelly ended up in one of the German kingdoms. So all of the information that they had channeled through these blood offerings went with Edward Kelly to Germany. And Germany wasn't called Germany back then it was called Prussia and it was during that time it was just a bunch of different kingdoms but then if you fast forward into the mid 1800s into the Sonora Aero Club in Northern California you'll see the the case of the airship mystery and who sponsored this this was Prussia sponsoring how to create these airship craft and uh, Germany has had a huge influence, which again, it wasn't Germany then, it wasn't Germany until a f- few years later, but it was Prussia then. Uh, it's had this influence around the occult, uh, um, channeling spirits, uh, uh, and all those kind of what people would describe as like woo woo type things. But it's just interesting because the whole airship mystery of the, the mid 1800s in Northern California, they were creating and, and building what people would claim to be UFOs nowadays yeah. And, yeah. and flying saucers, but it was human technology. And if you look back through the newspapers of that time, you'll see that people are spotting weird, strange things in the, in the sky. And this was like decades and decades before the Wright brothers flew at uh, Kitty Hawk. So it's just a really weird connection there. And then you fast forward a little bit into world war two, you see the, the Glocka bell technology, which was supposedly using the exact same kind of, technology that uh the sonora aero club was using as well they were using a green spinning mercury fuel additive the uh, germans during world war ii was using a red spinning uh, mercury fuel additive which supposedly gave off a a lot of radiation so it's uh just thought that that was a very interesting connection there walter bosley has written uh, s- several books about the snore era club but i just thought that it was important to mention yeah yeah i mean cigar shaped ufos right remember that one sound like an airship yep definitely so, and, and of course you know with you know world war ii and mr mustache man they, they were running around the world right looking for relics and things and connected to the whole real society so there's a whole a whole chain of events and then you can take that forward to those you know the top scientists and, and rocketeers and that were, were taken across in project paperclip and formed nasa and and so now they're, they're in in america right so it's it's there's definitely a chain of, of something of some kind of knowledge or something you know and and not not to mention that you know germany in world war ii advanced very quickly right with its tech you know where did all this stuff really come from all this rocketry, all the airship, all the stuff, right? It's and and where did why were they chasing relics? Was that something they were told to do? Or, I mean, it, it seems very unlikely that someone who got to the point of ruling a country, you know, if it happens the way we're told, would then become so obsessed with some ancient story of some you know magical relic that they put all the funds of the country into running around looking for these things, right? It, it's. So there's obviously some more knowledge there that that, he, that whoever it was knew that these relics were, were real and actually did have power of some kind. You know, there's... yeah, and you're talking about Project Paperclip there. That's a very interesting one. But people really tend to look over the fact that uh, Russia officially got more paperclip Germans than the United oh. States. Oh, I, I did, did not know that. that. No, I didn't know that either. Interesting. Uh, the Russians' version of Project Paperclip uh, 
brought 2,500 former uh, German scientists and specialists were relocated to the Soviet Union, along with uh, 4,000 family members were relocated as well. So that tolls about 6,500 Germans relocated to Russia after World War II officially. And officially, the United States uh, got 1,600. Now, that number uh, can be fictitious. It's supposedly uh, unofficially closer to the range of 10,000. But again, that's official official documentation. The 1,600 came in the U.S. So the Russia actually got quadruple the amount of German scientists, and they did it in one large like lump uh, yeah. replacement, right? The United States did it over... A uh, period of, I, I believe, like six to seven years, maybe even longer. But Russia just did it all at one time, all in one lump. So, and I'm pretty sure that they got them first. So th- that means, well, they had the first pick. So the United States kind of got the the leftovers and the people that uh, maybe weren't the best at what they were doing and uh russia got all the the people first which then you know begs the question of the the cold war you know like what's going on there why did we do that you know was it because our germans were at odds with each with each other's germans like i don't know and then the blood sacrifices right wasn't stalin after that so they starved millions of people and killed millions of their own population United States as well has been at war for, you know, hundreds of years nonstop. I've heard, you know, one after the next, one after the next. So if they're using blood sacrifices to power, which you guys just mentioned, you know, in the project paper clips and or whatever they were called going to Russia, it seemed to me that's still going on. You know, they're looking for those vampires, a non non ending supply of human sacrifice uh, right into what they're doing, you know, recently in different parts of the world, supposedly, you know, today. You know, more blood sacrifice, more bringing about, you know, pain and suffering, more more child sacrifice. No doubt about that too, you know, and then that uh, brings about, um, you know, the uh, the idea of how they're powering what you've mentioned, these these crafts that they're building. You know, maybe it's not a physical thing that they're looking into building, you know, beyond the cigar shapes or the bell shapes. Maybe it's more of a something, as you mentioned, mercury, which if you look at the old alchemists, they talk about, you know, there was a special kind of mercury they used to, to do in the gold transformation, right? Wasn't to transform lead to gold. It was the transformation of humanity or the human energy towards something of a higher level wonder if it's all tied together. Yeah, make it interesting, right? It's the only metal that, that well, liquid, but that amalgams that, that basically we just join with another metal, right? We just fucking develop it. So it's, who knows? But I mean, I think, you know, the thing is, like, there's, there's I mean, there's so much information come out, right? In the last four years since everyone's, you know, been waking up and all this kind of stuff. And I think that's on purpose, right, to, to confuse us. And, to, and again, it's the attention thing. So everyone was looking here, is this right? Is this right to so listen to that person? Is that person a shield? And, you know, I, I, I always say it's the 80-20 rule, right? Mm. In, in truth, there's some lies. In every lies, there's some truth. But, you know, I think the, the way out is in, right? Like, like we can spend our lives, you know, trying to work out what outside of us is correct and true, or we could spend that time working out what inside of us is correct and true. And I think that's probably more important, right? Because once you know who you are, then you can really start to to do things, do things differently that, that are that are yours, right? I think, I mean, one of our biggest problems is people are just copying each other, right? There's no new, new stuff coming out. And you see it on, you know, YouTube and all these platforms. People, someone gets an idea and everyone just copies it. It's just, it's crazy. So, you know, I, I think that, the way to, to you know go forward is really to to go inside, but to understand that you know it's you, right? You, you're really the only person you can rely on. You're you're really the only person who who knows what you're thinking, and you've got everything you need. You know we're taught that we need all this stuff from outside of us, and we need other people, and we need all this support and all this blah 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 blah. Right, run with the herd, um, but. I think the most powerful people and the people who affect, you know, this place the most are the ones who who know who they are and they're sure of who they are and what they want to do. And so they just do it. 
that they don't waste time looking for people to come with them or to support them or for this or for that. They just start walking. And I think once you start doing that, then everything that you need tends to come, you know, to you, right? Where we are taught to do it the other way around. Get everything we need first and then then I can start, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think that's the way forward is, is really to, you know, we, they've just de depowered us so much. You know, the average person doesn't really think that they're worth much, doesn't think they can do much to change, you know, anything. But that's, to me, that's the biggest lie of all. What We are the power as, as far as I'm concerned and we just need to take it back as they say, right? You know, even Ryder mentioned in our last chat, which was very interesting, that how, you know, he went through his own challenges and you have to face them a thousand times until you change, which is very inspirational. And a lot of people will try once or twice to do something new and then give up when it doesn't work. And, you know, we've all mm -hmm. seen that sometimes, you know, how, how many times did you have to try something new when you were a little boy, before you learned how to walk, before you learned how to do well in talking to ladies, before you learned, you know, how to dress or dance? I mean, probably instinctively oh. you practiced a thousand times before you learned a new skill? Like how, how much baseball practice do these guys do before they can hit a home run in the major leagues? It's like 20 years practice every day, eight hours a day before they finally figure it out. And in the modern age, you know, as you've said, where people are getting used to instant gratification, they go, oh, I tried that twice, didn't work. Next, where if you really consider the deeper aspects of how you learn, you know, maybe you have to do something for 10 years, you know, before you become an expert at it, you know, a thousand times before you figure mm -hmm. it out. And maybe that's how, you know, as Campbell said, you do fine at the end of the time is figure out what you need to do and don't give up if it doesn't work the first, second or 100th time. That's very important because everyone learns in a different kind of way. And I think that that has been the problem with the school systems. I know we talked a little bit about the school systems uh on our previous show, uh, but they want to blanket everybody with the same kind of learning uh, curriculum, right? When that's not how everyone learns. So therefore you get people that don't learn that way and they can't get a hold of it. See, I've always learned from repetition and watching other people kind of do things. And uh, if I can watch someone do something a few times in a row, uh, then I can mostly do it. That's how I played musical instruments growing up was uh, by memory, by muscle memory, uh, watch someone play something, then I would be able to play it. You know, and other people learn in different ways. A lot of, some people learn by like studying things and, and reading books and uh, which, you know, I, I read as well, but I think that we've gotten to a point within our society that we've just tried to take the, 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 the we've been led to believe that the same type of learning process works for everyone when it doesn't and no one has that individuality like a, a teacher or a uh, i mean even in college it goes all the way up in in the college they don't really take that one or two or a handful of people aside and be like hey here's another way that you can figure this stuff out and when people they whenever especially children They'll, they'll think that they're dumb or they'll think that they're not smart or they'll, they'll think that they're stupid because they can't learn the same way that other people learn. And they think, well, why am I not understanding this? Why am I not getting this? Well, it's because the curriculum and the way that it's being taught to you isn't the way that you comprehend things. Mm. And yep. that's been, I think, a huge downfall of our society as a whole is there's not any individualism to the school system to the uh the, the colleges and to education it's just all blanketed with the exact same rules the exact same curriculum and there's no individuality to it yeah man be autodidactic <laughs> so, you know, self education right like i remember with maths like when i was in school that they'd even make you do like show you're working out and the working out had to be a certain way and my brain didn't work that way, and I'd always do it a different way. And my way was much quicker, by the way, much much less steps than that. Um, and I'd always get the right answer, but I'd always get marked down because I hadn't done the working yeah, out there. But, but I refused to. I was just like, well, that's dumb. I don't understand it. Um, but this is the thing. Most people, yeah, get, get sort of hammered and think, oh, it's me. I'm the stupid one where I guess I was lucky and arrogant enough to think that the, the teachers were stupid and <laughs> Right, so I just kept going. Um, but but it's you know 
th this is the thing. They just want to control, just control our thought process. So, you know, the, the, the further you can get away from that. And, you know, I used to think a lot about this concept of, um, you know, natural thought or, or original thought and the fact that we just don't have it. We, we, it's very, very rare, right? even in your own mind to have original thoughts like most of the stuff it's playbacks of other stuff or other people's opinions so you know just focusing on that like like what what's what what's my thought you know what am i thinking what's my message just you know in in whichever way right meditation mm. you know and meditation can be anything it can be gardening it can be working on a car right and then suddenly you get it oh that's what that's how to fix it you know, but when you, we're, we're trained so much to just repeat, 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 right? School again, you know, the teacher stands up there, gives you information, and the, you're only smart if you can repeat back. You know, I'm going to take you, a if short you, if break. You can think keep, of a different keep point, sharing. Oh, yep. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's a change we've got to break, right? Um, you know, I've said, I've, one of my favorite sayings is the statue is not, not finished when there's nothing more to add. It's finished when there's nothing more to take away. And I think that's what happens to us. We get all this crap put on us and then it's the job of us stripping away and knowing what to get rid of. And then we get left with ourselves and then we can start to think clearly again. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, you're very lucky and uh, several of us are very lucky within school that we just... Uh, we doubled down on our own thought process and we were like, Hey, like this is the way that works for me. And we didn't get dissuaded by uh, teachers and, and people telling us uh, the way that they think we should be doing stuff. And I think that that's a very important thing because I don't believe that a lot of people can do that. Uh, and it's very unfortunate that, that it's that way. And when you look at, because uh, I've known several people throughout my life that uh, got involved in, you know, uh, drugs and uh, became major alcoholics because they were just different than everyone else. They couldn't find their home of people. They couldn't find their group of people. So then they just turned to uh, drugs and alcohol to fill that void within themselves, you know, and not really realizing that this is a lonely journey, right? <laughs> This is a lonely ass journey and uh, you really have no one other than yourself, you know, and it's, it's good to do these types of shows and uh, be with other people and stuff. But I think finding that and realizing and taking responsibility for your actions and your decisions, you have no one but yourself. You, you are your own individual. You got to swim through this mm -hmm. life. Uh, alone basically and realizing that and, and paving your own way and the dedication and the responsibility and uh the uh persistence is very important it's like you were just uh mentioning earlier some people they just do something a few times and then they're like oh well it wasn't successful it wasn't good you gotta just mm. keep hammering away at that thing and chipping away at it and eventually that will pay off and it might not, it's probably not going to be tomorrow. It's probably not going to be next week, next month, next year, maybe 10 years down the road. But thing about it is, is people really aren't successful in that Avenue until they're in their mid thirties or even into their forties. They really don't start getting, that's if they've stayed on that track uh, and uh, you know, broke away from, what other people want them to do and they're trying to go down their own path because normally your parents are like why do you want to do that don't do that don't be a filmmaker don't do all that because that's not going to pay the bills right yeah but they want that instant gratification and that's what a lot of this society has been built upon has been instant gratification right we want the the newest thing the quickest thing the easiest thing to get us to, from point a to point b when the long road which is what I'm calling it now. The, the wrong, the long road is way more fulfilling. Now the long road does take more work and time and effort, but in the end, you're going to reap more rewards. You know, it isn't it wonderful that we probably don't need anyone else. I mean, that's the beauty of it. I would say you're born with everything you need to get along. You know, you're being taught from the time you were little that you need, as Campbell said, you need this, you need that, you need the other thing, you need money, you need a relationship. 
you know, you need a blender, you know, whatever. And, you know, to come full circle and figure out you don't need nothing, right? You're breathing, you're alive, you know, one step in front of the other, you can figure it out. And if no one's with you, well, that's wonderful. You know, the Toltec said, I remember reading a book, which stuck with me to this day that uh, he makes loneliness his art. And I thought it was a beautiful, beautiful way of putting it, you know, to make loneliness your art and to create what you need to do. If you find yourself alone, you know, make art with your loneliness and see what you can do from there. And then, uh, you know, since this chat is about how we do find at the end of time, maybe that's how you do it. You have to be okay with being alone. You have to be okay with being autodidactic. You have to be okay with uh, failing a hundred times before you succeed at the hundred and tenth. Maybe we're holographic learners. I'm thinking as well, like Campbell said, I had the same experience. I would never show my work. And I got into arguments with my math teachers. I said, you're an idiot. I don't have to show my work. I got the right answer. That, you know, because maybe you're being trained to think instead of use your intuition. I would say that's what schooling really does. It beats your intuition out of you because if you can come up with the answer, what are you using? Who cares, right? <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But I don't think they're after the answers. They're not. They're after, you know, good little slaves to listen, show your work means that you've got to do it the same way as everyone else, like Ryder said. So this is the only way you get full grades. You know, this is the only way you get that A gold star. This is the only way you get that job. There's no other way. <laughs> this is it. And, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps that is what leads, you know, as I, I caught the, the the end of that Ryder, you know, the alcoholism and the drugs and what the, the indulgence and whatever, because you you know, you think there's the only way and you're not fitting in. And so what do you do? Well, you know, try to make yourself feel better any way you can. Yeah, hey man, they give us all the options too, don't they? Whatever you want, <laughs> you know, you can get it. Um, but, you know, if, it, if it's a natural herb, then you probably can't. But, yeah, mistakes, right? Everything, everything you know, take one, take two. This is what people think it, it's a mistake, but it's not. It, it's just a mistake, right? So you just take, take two, take 100, just keep going until you're, until you get there, but this I, I think is also from people who don't believe in themselves. That they don't think they've they've got what it takes, and 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 subconsciously they're telling themselves, "I'm going to fail. I can't do this." But in the conscious mind, they're like, "Oh, I'm going to do it. I'll give it a go." But of course, the subconscious wins, and like two or three times, they're like, "I oh, see, I was right. I knew it wouldn't work." Um, and of course, you know, it, it's all starting to do with the subconscious, which is what they work on, like programmers, but. I mean, I've just personally, I've just over the last, you know, kind of week or so really sort of come to terms with that, that, that it is only you, right? It is only, it'd be great to have help and it'd be great to have this and it'd be great to have that. But the thing is, you know, we can't change other people. We can influence them, but we can't, you know, we can't make people come along and want our dream or want our goals. Um, but like I said before, if, if we have, you know, the courage to, to walk and to keep going in that direction and to believe in it, then... The people we need tend to show up anyway, right? Mm. But, but you know, just in my life, I still was thinking, you know, oh, I want to get this done, up, you know, and I'd, I'd be thinking, oh, I need this person or this person could help me. With it. But, you know, that's all really got to go out the window. It's got to be you. What, what can you do? Because that's really the only thing you can affect. You know, if you think you can affect other people and, and all this, you're really kidding yourself. Like, well, affect them, but you can't tell and make people do anything. No. You, you just can't. Except no. for yourself. And to trust yourself, you know, to learn how to trust yourself. I would say that's a key one that they don't teach you in school. To trust your guts, to trust your intuition, to trust your heart, no matter what. You know, I, if there's a creator, why would the creator make a mistake in making you, right? No matter how different or weird or strange you are. You know, you're, you know, you're wonderful. You're full of wonder. You should be different. And the challenge is in trusting that difference so that you can be the best you, there's a bazillion flowers. I don't want to look at the same flower every day. You know, when I go out and I see a new one, that's what catches my eye. You know, when I'm walking down the street and it happens to me here a lot, you know, since I'm in a new part of the world for myself, I see a new bird or a new plant or hear a new sound, which I do. That's what catch. That's what I'm interested in exploring, right? To go, oh, I didn't see that flower before. I haven't seen that before. What's that? You know, what's that bird sound? I, I'm sure I haven't heard that. And that's what draws my imagination and my attention and my awareness towards something wonderful. So if people put that in their heart and realize it's amazing to be different. It's fantastic to have a different smell and a different look and a different idea and a different notion and in different ways or a different dance or to make different food, whatever, because that's really what the world is after is, you know, this expansion of difference, you know, not the contraction where we're all one, you know, that which is one of those memes, which I know is a lot of bullshit that gets passed along by the new age. We're all one. We're, no, we're not. I mean, we're all here, but we're not all one, you know, we're all different.
Which is really interesting. There's this uh, contactee that really no one knows about. Uh, his name is Samuel Eden Thompson, and he apparently met extraterrestrials in Washington in 1950. And his entire story was really overshadowed by Kenneth Arnold and uh, Betty and Barney Hill later on. But uh, it's a very interesting story. And he was apparently driving his vehicle in Washington. He came across this uh, craft. Uh, there was a ramp. He walked up to the ramp. These uh, beings came out. There was apparently 25 different beings. There was like 15 kids. And uh, they uh, they were supposed, he said that they were from Venus, uh, that, that they were Venetians. And they gave him all of this information. And I think that the most interesting, and I'm not saying any of it's real. I don't necessarily believe in it, but I take it as information and a part of a, a historical record. So I think it's important to talk about. So one of the most interesting things that they told him, they said, the problem with Earth is that all of the people of Earth are born under different astrological signs. They're all born under different stars. They're all born under different planets. But the people on Venus are all born under the exact same astrological signs. So they're like a hive mind, right? Mm. And see, I don't take that as a negative thing. I don't think that it's a negative thing that we're all born under different astrological signs because you can get into astrology and all that and, and see that the stars really do make a difference in our life. If you get a really, really good astrological reading, that person can literally tell you everything that's happened to you in your life and tell you what uh, may happen to you in the future. So it really does, uh, astrology really does make a difference in cultivating and creating our personality and uh, the way that we live and the events that may or may not happen in the future. But I don't take that as like a bad thing because I think that that's what makes us special here is that we all are different. We all are born under different astrological signs. No one is born under the exact same astrological signs at any given time. And that makes us very, very special here. And uh, and some people would be like, oh, well, I want the utopian type of, type of uh, hive mind where everyone gets along and everyone's peaceful. Well, that's the freaking New World Order, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <Not awesome. laughs> yeah. That is what the new world <laughs> order is. And these people don't realize that that is actually what they're fighting for. That's really what they want. They, they think that they're against it, but they're really for it. If they want everything to be peace and everything to be harmony in this golden age, that is a dictatorship. Yeah. That's not this freedom that people think that it is. So No, yeah. no, I mean, freedom, and this is what most people, you know, don't think about or, or like about it is true freedom is letting everyone else be free right to be who they want to be but people people don't like that part of freedom they just want their freedom and let everyone else should do what they tell them to do but but yeah ultimate freedom is what we're all allowed to do what we want to do obviously you know do no harm but apart from that you know let people live right i think an adult is usually an adult enough to allow others to do what they need to do to stand back even if you don't agree with them and to allow them to, you know, fulfill the process they need, because you know, Ryder made a good point. You don't know what another person needs. You don't know what another, you know, you don't know. Maybe someone needs to have be an alcoholic for three years before they stop. Maybe someone needs to be in a horrible relationship before they change their mind. You know, someone needs to be in a bad job before they decide to be in a good job. You know, someone needs to get sick of diabetes before they quit sugar. I don't know. I have no idea what someone else needs before the, you know they fulfill their own destiny, whatever that is for them. And to allow people, you know, that's the beauty of being alive and how you can have your own intelligence is, you know, to be strong enough to allow people to do what you don't like or what you don't think they should do or what you know doesn't look good to you. But you know, to stand back and go, you know, if you say so, you know, get at it. You know, perhaps you know one day that'll help you out and that'll help the rest of us out. And uh, who am I to say what you need to do and not do? It's just ridiculous. Yeah, well, this is a big thing that's gone on in the last, you know, couple of years, right? Everyone running around trying to wake people up. Yeah. You know, it's like, what are you doing, right? If you, if you, if you want to wake someone up, go find a mirror. Mm -hmm. like, seriously, like, 
you, you can't change it. You can influence them, but the best way to influence is to change yourself and do the best you can and people will see you and they'll go, oh, okay, and they'll learn from that. But, but yeah, this whole, um, you know, change, the, the way to change my world is to change the outside world. Apart from the fact that it's impossible, it, it's crazy, right? It's crazy. So I think, you know, again, I think I'm probably just, you know, repeating myself, but I think the way forward is is to really focus on what we want and how we can change and understand that that's, that's all, you know, that's our job, right? We don't have the right, like you said, Lorenzo, to go and, and change other people. Like how do we know that, that someone doesn't need to go through tragedy to to learn, you know, that they're, that they're a strong person? How do we know that, you know, someone doesn't have to go through a bad relationship to understand that they're worthy of more, you know? This, this is not our business. Our business is us. And and it's and so that's, you know, a big thing that, that you know, I'd get out because I know a lot of people out there are still on that sort of tangent, you know, let's wake the world up, let's wake people up. But, you know, I, I'd implore you to, you know, spend more time waking yourself up. All right. Yeah, and, and not only that, too, the, the whole wake people up mm -hmm. thing is, is completely ridiculous and is, is so backwards because... 90% of the information that they would give to wake yeah, somebody yeah, yeah. up is wrong, you know, and uh, th that's a really big problem as well. And it's getting people on a, uh, getting people off base of, of actually looking into uh, themselves and, and going within to figure out what's actually happening with them. And I agree with the, that it's a it's an individual thing and people should be leading by example and not telling people what to believe and just you know letting letting it go and if people find what i've said interesting then great if it changed something it gave them a new thought process then great if something that campbell said changed somebody uh then great like it, it shoving things down people's throats doesn't help it doesn't do anything it actually turns them away from the objective that you're trying to create right it's just about kind mm -hmm. of just planting seeds just just planting throw a seeds. little interesting thing in there every once in a while you know that's what i do with normal everyday people that isn't a part of this echo chamber that we've created in this community like just you know people that i, I have a conversation with in the grocery store or at the gym or like wherever it is that i that i am I play stupid with those people, you know, because they don't want to listen to someone preaching to them. No. They don't want to listen to someone that thinks that they know everything about everything. And I've never claimed to know everything about it, everything, but that's how it comes off to somebody that is not a part of this community is that you're preaching to them and you act acting like a know-it-all. So I just act like an idiot to these people. It's like, Hey, what, what do you think about those UFOs? Do you think there's anything, you think there's any, anything to that? You know, what do you think it's military technology? And I'm like, what do you think about history? Wait, what do you think about the pyramids, dude? You think the how did they build those pyramids, bro? You know, and I just like like I think that that's more important than uh going off on a long, huge tangent on uh normal everyday people about what you believe. It's better to ask them and then kind of interject some interesting thoughts into the conversation along the way. I think that that does more than uh, telling them anything. Yeah, honest humility. There's not enough of that around. Yeah. If you're comfortable no. enough in your own truth, in your own life, you don't care if anyone believes you. Yeah. Yeah, then, And if you're sure. experimenting with the people around you, like Ryder just said, that's amazing, you know, to see how you can uh, allow them to figure it out. Like a good parent isn't going to tell a child what to do. We'll just encourage them to do what they want to do. Mm. Yeah, I mean, questions, right? Just getting people to ask different questions. That, that I think, does or can change people, right? If you, you know, yell at someone and tell them, blah, 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 they're, they're just going to dump that. They don't care, right? But if you can ask them a question, like, how did they, how did, they build the pyramids? That's something that is going to be in their mind, and they'll probably keep thinking on it, right? So I think, you know, that's all I try and do is, is get people to ask better questions. That's my hope. And that's why, like, YouTube, right? Like, you can just put up information, and if people want to watch it, they watch it. If they don't want to watch it, they don't. It's not, I'm not forcing it on anyone, you know? So I think, yeah, I, I, I agree with everything that's been said, basically. All right. Well, right, or maybe we've come to a natural conclusion to, you know, how to do fine at the end of time. Figure yourself out, be more humble, 
keep at it. And uh, if you make a mistake, do it again and again and again. Don't try and push your notions on anyone else and uh, you know, figure it out for yourself. And if someone's there with you, fantastic. I'm meeting new friends. You know, Ryder and I have had a couple of good chats and it feels like we'll probably have several more. You know, Campbell and I have done hundreds and well, how does this happen? No idea, right? You know, I reached out to Ryder. I did reach out to Campbell originally, but I had to be confident enough in my own ability to want to chat with people and to make these videos and to meet like-minded men to grow with before it happened. So I had to change myself first. And then I got, you know, the corroborations and the friendships, you know, I've even met Campbell face to face, you know, not so long ago. So, you know, you never know how you're going to get in the same room, shake hands and give a hug to someone down the road just by changing who you are and how you are and what you feel like making in this life. It's always cool meeting people from the internet in person. Yeah, it's really, it's really cool. It's really interesting. I've met uh, quite a few people that I've met on the internet and doing sh shows with. It's, uh, it's really cool. And some of my best friends are from this community, you know? So uh, yeah, I, it's like what you said, if, if you're alone and you're uh, then, okay. If you have people mm -hmm. around you, then okay. It doesn't need to be <laughs> one way or the other, just let things flow. And uh and do things the way that you think that is the best way to do them. I mean, everything is based off of experience, right? Your experience is different than my experience, but there's no reason that uh, a group of people can't get along and have a great conversation. And I think that that is what we did here today. And uh, thank you both. Really appreciate your time. I'd like to have you both on um, my channel here sometime soon. Anytime, Ryder. I've enjoyed this and I'm ready for more. Yeah, nice to meet you, Ryder. Yeah, yeah. And everyone out there, yeah, like just I think trust yourself. Um, you've got everything you need, you know, in your side. And if you can't see, just just look a bit deeper and yep. stay awesome because you are. Stay awesome, be yourself, keep trying. I love you all very much. Ryder, thank you so much for being here. Campbell, last second, I appreciate you being here as well. This has been an amazing chat. I'm gonna get it up real soon. I'll let you guys know when it's live, and I hope to see you all very, very soon. Bye for now. Cheers, guys. Freedom first is what I say Nothing now gonna get in my way